Yep. It's the question is.
For more than 50 years, the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations has been the leader in promoting mutual understanding between the United States and China, the most important relationship of the 21st century. The National Committee strengthens that relationship by helping people on both sides of the Pacific to understand one another better and to address issues of mutual concern through exchanges, dialogues, and other activities. These programs address key issues, such as economic relations, rule of law, security, public health, and the environment, in the belief that constructive Sino-American relations benefit both countries as well as the global community. Good evening. I'm Steve Orleans, President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, coming to you live from Washington, D.C. And I'm pleased to welcome audiences from over 70 venues throughout the United States, Canada, and China to our 18th annual China Town Hall. Each year, we convene China Town Hall because we believe in the importance of educating the public about all that is happening in the U.S.-China relationship. This past year, in fact, exactly 12 months, has been pivotal, pivotal for bilateral ties, culminating in President Biden and President Xi meeting in San Francisco. Since then, we've seen progress on a number of issues, including bilateral communication and fentanyl control. And just last week, we saw Secretary Yellen traveled to Beijing to meet with senior Chinese leaders. Yet deep differences still divide our two countries. Can the countries capitalize on this cooperative period, or will we return to a period of tense ties? We're thrilled to have the Deputy Secretary of State, Dr. Kurt Campbell, with us here tonight to discuss the current state of U.S.-China relations and answer your questions. Prior to assuming his current position, Deputy Secretary Campbell served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs at the National Security Council. During his distinguished career, he's also served in senior position at the State Department, Defense Department, Treasury, and NSE. Full disclosure, he served as a director of the National Committee from 2013 to 2020. And also full disclosure, I'm proud to call him a friend. To participate in the conversation tonight on Twitter, use the hashtag CTH2024. You can also scan the QR code on the bottom of your screen to take a poll and share your thoughts on US-China relations. Let me begin with a few of my own questions for Deputy Secretary Campbell. Kurt, welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. I was just noting this is your second appearance on Ta China Town Hall, and it's only our 18th time. But tell Can I just say, please call me Kurt, if you would, Steve. It's, it's Thank tough you. to call you Deputy Secretary. It's tough Campbell. even for me, actually. <laughs> so. the, um, tell us where we are in U.S.-China relations, where we've come from, and where we're going, and what happens uh, assuming President Biden is reelected. So let me, if I could, first of all, it's an honor to be with you, Steve, and I welcome everyone from many places around the United States who have an interest and are focused on where U.S.-China relations are going. And I, I welcome you all and thanks for the opportunity. I want to say a word just quickly about Steve. If we are able to manage our way through a very challenging time, I acknowledge that uh, and I live it. Um, it will largely be due to key people who are passionate and committed and determined to find common ground. I know of no person who has dedicated more of their life to finding that common ground than you, Stephen. We have not always agreed, but the truth is I've learned enormous amount from you, and I appreciate the opportunity to give and take. So look, I, I would say this. Um, I think when President Biden came into power, I think there was a sense that uh, China was testing us uh, and was proceeding under the belief that the United States was in some sort of hurtling decline and that they believed that they could um, press us in key ways, take advantage of 
certain opportunities in technology and security and the like. And I think what President Biden and his team has sought to do is put in place a consequential set of steps, first beginning with investment in the key areas of national strength, which increasingly, Steve, as you know, will be in technology. Issues like semiconductors, AI, quantum computing, synthetic biology, robotics, and recognizing that this is the high ground for um, national power and strategic competition. Secondly, working closely with allies and partners um, to build uh, a consensus around maintaining the global operating system, which we believe has been so beneficial, particularly the Indo-Pacific. If you look at the last 60 or 70 years, I would argue that they've been the best with respect to lifting people out of poverty, huge amount of innovation. And I think the US commitment to peace and stability has been a large part of that. And then I think building on those foundational pieces has been a substantial bilateral commitment to finding common ground, but also being clear headed about uh, engagement with China. And so what we've seen is a series of engagement, engagements, probably the most effective, uh, as you uh, indicate, Steve, was in San Francisco, in which the two leaders underscored that, yes, there are elements of competition in our relationship. We want to keep those elements healthy. We want to keep that competition from veering into confrontation or conflict. We believe that the way to do that is to keep lines of communication open and the ability to be able to engage when there's misunderstandings or potentials for accidents. But then at the same time, find those areas where it will be essential to maintain communication and working together. I note, Steve, that you were in Beijing just the last couple of weeks with the most distinguished delegation of uh, business and financial leaders trying to figure out what's going on in China right now and what is the nature of our economic relationship. But we underscore fundamentally the need to work on existential questions like climate change, we think the people-to-people -people dimension, which has animated so much of our relationship in the hopes of people on both sides, seeking steps to increase trade, travel, those things are practical steps that we need to take. But at the same time, I know this is a long answer, we are having to deal with challenging issues like China's support for Russia in the Ukraine war. Obviously, we're trying to manage carefully and engage on issues where we have differences of view. And I think ultimately, the visit of Secretary Yellen, the call between President Biden, and President Xi that preceded that, the upcoming visit of Secretary Blinken, these are all indications that both sides, I think for now, are determined to keep U.S.-China relations on a steady, stable path. Has the date been set for Secretary Blinken going? I think it probably has, but I don't think I'm supposed to announce it. But it's, <laughs> but it's, and I'm, I'm learning all these things now in this new role. But, but it will be coming up soon. And, and look, we think this will be a major visit. I think we want to display other elements of the relationship in terms of education, business, and we expect him to see the senior leaders as well. You mentioned my visit a couple of weeks ago and where we had the opportunity with some business leaders yes. to meet with President Xi. One of the issues he raised and one which I've actually raised is kind of the over securitization of US-China relations. You know, we've seen cranes, chips, EVs, batteries fall within now a definition of national security. What's going on there and what should we do? He's concerned that ultimately when you, and he, he implicitly recognize the Chinese do this too. Yeah. So can the two sides engage in a discussion of what is national security, get a definition? Well, well look, it's going to be important to have those discussions, Steve. I, I would simply say that, that the larger context here is important. Last year was an absolute banner year in trade. There's substantial investment flowing in both directions. Lots of Chinese goods come to the United States, lots of opportunities. Um, yes, we do hear from Chinese interlocutors occasionally about, gee, you're targeting our social media companies. I would just simply say that 
our social media <laughs> companies are not allowed to right. engage in China. So there is an unequal playing field to begin with. And, and so look, I think what's important um, uh, on our part is to explain clearly what it means to have uh, high walls or high fences and small yard to make sure that only the most careful things that, that require uh, scrutiny are um, observed with respect to potential um, uh, controls or uh, uh, areas that we would mm -hmm. um, prevent certain kinds of engagement with China. And, and much of those uh, efforts tend to be in technology areas, AI chips and the like. And I think ultimately our focus in technology are in uh, dual use capabilities that potentially could have security uses that are antithetical to our interests. Mm -hmm. And I think we've been clear about that with our Chinese interlocutors. I will also say that if you listen carefully, what, what Secretary Yellen indicated on her recent trip is that we're also concerned by the potential of China seeking to use their overcapacity to flood American and other global markets. And she's warned, I think appropriately, and she has worked assiduously to build stronger ties between the United States and China, but he, she's warned her economic and treasury ministry of, of finance counterparts that if those steps are taken, we will not sit by idly. And what happened 10 years ago on steel with Chinese uh, products basically uh, squashing American uh, competition, we, we, we won't and cannot sit by idly to let that happen. And so I, I do think we've sought to explain clearly what our issues are. And I also believe that those conversations are helpful and they are ongoing, Steve. So this is not a dialogue of the death. It's a death. It is not a situation in which we're not interacting regularly. We are. And we are explaining clearly and unambiguously what our concerns are. Can we negotiate whitelists, things which are basically going to be telling businesses it's okay, it's okay, both in terms of goods and investment? So look, I, I, I think we've sought in private conversations with businesses um, to basically give indicators where there are uh, warning signals. And we've also indicated areas that we think are unexceptional more generally. I think today there's much greater clarity in the business community about what's acceptable and what is not. I, but I will also say, Steve, if I can, I think the limiting factor is not the U.S. government response. I think you were there with the business community. The truth is there's some real challenges currently to operating yeah. in China. I know Chinese friends interlocutors are trying to deal with that, but they have a long way to go. The business environment is not nearly as welcoming as it was 15 or 20 years ago. And, and I think being honest with Chinese interlocutors about that is important. It's, you know, oftentimes, you, you know, we'll listen to Chinese interlocutors and they'll say, look, we're opening up and we're following reform. But then if you really chase that down and ask for specifics, um, they're not as forthcoming. Yeah, we certainly raise those issues with, yeah. with President Xi, the concern about the Chinese economy, concern about the investment environment. And he responded, you know, that uh, reform and opening has been the foundation for China's success and will we'll go in that direction, will continue to go in that direction. Of course, the business community says, well, the proof is going to be in the pudding. Yeah. We, we got it exactly what you're saying. We have to see how things I, are. But just, just on that, Steve, I will say this. Look, I, I don't envy the current generation of financial diplomats in China. The challenges are enormous, but they're also following in the wake of literally the most effective global diplomats, financial engineers of modern times. Wan Xishan, Liu He, these people were incredibly effective at managing the opening to the West and trying to preserve certain advantages. I think some of the, the, the current team have a lot to prove, and I think there's pressure on them to try to be able to take the necessary steps to deal with youth unemployment, property challenges, uh, issues about domestic demand, global confidence generally in 
among Chinese yeah. firms. These are all things that, frankly, are unrelated to the United States that China will have to deal with. We want to go to our first audience question, which is going to be from Isabel Mashlab at Northwestern University's Town Hall. Isabel, go ahead. Hi, I'm Isabel Mashlab. I'm a junior from Iowa City, Iowa, and I'm studying international studies and political science. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my question is, President Xi Jinping said to President Biden last week on their phone call that China is not trying to outcompete the United States. Do you believe this to be true? How would you describe the current U.S.-China relationship? B before you answer that question, thank you. It's a great question. The um, We're trying something new this year, which is we have, uh, we're polling our audience uh, on what they think uh, China is is you know, one word and we have competitor partner frenemy or enemy and obviously competitor looks like it's 57 percent frenemy 30 percent enemy only six percent and partner seven percent so that's kind of obviously we we are this is a very unscientific sample but but it's a sophisticated sample and i appreciate the question very much Thank you for that. Look, my sense is uh, that uh, China is a serious country. I think they seek advantage where they can find it. And yes, I think they are fierce, intense competitors, as is the United States. I think competition is what has driven the United States forward. It is what animates uh, China's purpose, both domestically and the global stage. And so I don't think we should in any way discourage fierce competition. I think the key is to make sure that that competition is fair, that it is transparent, and that it doesn't veer into conflict uh, or uh, instability. And I think that's our goal as we go forward. But I do believe that China is competing to win without question. Yeah. Let's go to our, our next question uh, to Tulane University Town Hall. Uh, Gabriella. Hello, De Deputy Secretary Campbell. My name is Gabriella Preziosi, and I go to Tulane University. Um, thank you so much for having me. My question is, given the complexities of the United States-China relationship, what are the key areas you believe the United States can and should seek engagement with China, and how would you prioritize these areas? We also polled the audience, this coincidence, we also polled the audience on, on this. So let's see what the results of that were. In other words, where are the areas um, that the audience thought we could cooperate? And it looks like there's a glare. Fencing. Trade and investment, uh, illicit drugs looks substantial there. I can't tell if that's, um, uh, looks like it's, uh, a nine or nine percent. I'm yeah. hard to tell exactly, but people to people looks like it's three four yeah. percent. International conflict resolution, which I take it refers to the Middle East and Ukraine, twenty two percent. Technology, nineteen percent. Climate, twenty eight percent. Illicit drugs, thirty something percent, and trade and investment, twenty seven percent. But where do you think we could cooperate? These are all. This is a great list. This I just want to commend you on this this format, Steve. It's wonderful to link all these people together, and it's great to see students so uh, engaged. And I I commend you on that. The important role of thinking about the world and asking these hard questions. Look, um, these are all critical issues at my core. I believe that the essential fundamental responsibility of the United States and China is to take climate uh, seriously as an existential issue. I really commend the work, the passionate work that Secretary Kerry as our climate envoy uh, undertook uh, uh, um, really uh, without uh, any pause and tremendous intensity over the course of the last three years. But I will also say, I, I think the United States has been ambitious in a number of areas. We're going to we're going to need to see more from China, and I think given their slowdown, some of their um, more ambition uh, ambitious climate goals have fallen by the wayside. I think we're at a situation now where China's uh, China's emissions are over fifty percent of global emissions uh, and rising. Um, uh, they've made a big deal about not financing coal uh, 
plants externally, but have continued them domestically. Um, these are areas that we've got to be clear about. And I think, you know, we tend to just be grateful when Chinese interlocutors come to um, come to various international climate fora. We need to see more progress there. I think the United States has taken very challenging steps. Our issues are going to be follow through more than anything else. For China, it is to make the kind of commitments and follow through on them domestically more than anything else. I think uh, people to people uh, issues are important, educational opportunities. I do think there are areas where the United States and China can work together. When I was assistant secretary here in the past, we worked quietly on uh, issues that were uh, challenging on the Korean Peninsula with North Korea. We also worked, Steve, on Burma. Mm -hmm. I think there are areas where our interests uh, overlap and we can perhaps not necessarily cooperate, but align and make sure that we are in close uh, consultation and communication. Ultimately, what we have to be about is building habits of cooperation. And in truth, despite the remarkable um, engagement between our two sides, the, the sense of entanglement economically and commercially, we, we have not built the habits of necessary cooperation that will be essential if the U.S.-China relationship yeah. is to flourish into the future. How destructive is China's relationship with Russia in terms of building these habits of cooperation? So this morning, as you know, I watch the Chinese news every morning. Yeah. And this morning I awaken to uh, Xi Jinping sitting at the head of the table with Lavrov sitting on his left and Wang Yi sitting on his right on a, on a rectangular table. And I said, Boy, you know, it was the celebration of the 75th anniversary yeah. of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the Soviet Union and China. But it's pretty destructive. Yeah. So, look, guys, I will tell you that, you know, Steve has helped me and, and tutored me and lectured me. The one area that we disagreed at the outset that I'm going to say on air that I think I was right about was the relationship between uh, China and Russia, I which I think disagree with. Well, you did a little. I, little I, I, I tell you we, what the other position we, is. We, we fought about it, but let, let me tell you what I think. What we're facing, uh, uh, friends. L look, um, we often hear from Chinese interlocutors like this is a red line, this is a core interest, and we have to trespass very carefully on areas that are so important to their sense of national identity and purpose for the United States. The awakening globally, our most important mission historically has been the maintenance of peace and stability in Europe, right? And um, I will say, and Steve knows this, we warned our Chinese interlocutors in advance of the invasion. Yes. I'm not sure they completely believed us or thought that maybe it would be a smaller thing, not an all out move and push. I think the Chinese leadership were surprised at the enormity of the uh, uh, initial actions and then were alarmed by uh, Putin being on the defense and defensive almost um, immediately. From that stage early in the conflict, I think Chinese interlocutors have made a decision to provide the necessary wherewithal in terms of machine tools, uh, joint use capabilities, a whole variety of capacities, Steve, to basically allow Russia to retool. Now, I think initially that was a defensive endeavor. They did not want to see regime change. They didn't want to see Putin fall. Let's remember that the relationship that she has invested the most with globally is not a Western leader, but President Putin. They've met dozens of times, up to 50 times, hundreds of hours. They've endeavored to build a partnership that's largely based on agreement with the West and the United States. But we're in a different situation now. So Russia is almost completely retooled. And they now pose a significant threat um, going forward to Ukraine, but to the surrounding region. And see, the point that we're trying to make to Chinese interlocutors is that this is our strategic interest. This is the most central issue. And China is 
involving themselves in a way that they think that we don't completely understand. We do know, understand what's going on. This is a substantial effort. We're making clear to European partners the risks of this. And we have told China directly, if this continues, it will have an impact on the US-China relationship. We will not sit by and say everything is fine. For instance, if Russia's mm -hmm. offenses continue and they gain territory in Ukraine, that will alter the balance of power in Europe in ways that are frankly uh, unacceptable from our perspective. And we will see this not as a just a Russian unique set of activities, but a conjoined set of activities mm -hmm activities backed by China, but also North Korea. This yeah. is antithetical to our interests. Yeah. And we've been clear and transparent with them about this. It was so interesting in the meeting with President Xi, he was talking about economic resilience of China. So he's sending a message, the economy, we are resilient. We're going to make our 5.2%. It's the new model. We're not, we could do 10, but that would be qualitatively not good growth. And then he said something, he says, we're resilient, look at our history. Then he said in 1956, the Soviet Union withdrew yeah. its machinery from the Northeastern China. And I kind of went, wow, he knows this history. Two years later, they detonate, detonated a nuclear weapon. And he, China did, but yeah. China showed its, res and, but that he used that as an example was kind of, to me, quite interesting. Well, um, Steve, I'm not sure you remember this, but we were, talking after the Bali summit. And I mentioned to you that President Xi used that very same historical experience. And I think occasionally what he will say to Western interlocutors is that no matter what you do, you try to withhold capabilities, we're going to persevere and we'll overcome obstacles. Um, look, I don't think that relates directly with um, Ukraine. I, I would simply say, that I do not believe what China is doing here is in the interests of Europe, the United States. But I will also say, I don't believe that China fundamentally um, wants to see at this juncture, the borders of Europe um, uh, fundamentally rewritten through mm -hmm. conflict. I don't think that is in their strategic yeah. interests. On something we, we disagreed about slightly, but then we came to agreement, which is official contact between, between uh, US government officials and Chinese government officials. How is it today? And how's your relationship in terms of communications with your counterpart? Look, Steve, at the time, one of the things that, that Steve uh, would, would, would ask me about, he said, look, you know, you've got to meet more, you've got to engage more the Chinese ambassador. I, I will tell you now it can be told, I was meeting with him regularly. It was really other meetings. He really wanted higher level engagement. This is our former ambassador, Ching Gong. And Steve was very good at trying to build those bridges. You know, at the time, I think Steve was the first to note that Ching Gong's, at that time, Ching Gong's potential trajectory would have made him one of the most powerful um, officials in the conduct of Chinese foreign ministry, basically of the last 30 or 40 years. He had that potential ahead of him. Now, we still don't really know exactly what happened. This is a topic that you cannot discuss with Chinese interlocutors. Right. If you brought his name up, there would be an immediate silence and there would be no discussion of him. Um, but the, the truth is that um, Steve's encouragement to me and others, we engaged with them um, intensively. It was very helpful in terms of passing messages at points of tension in cross-strait relations. Um, we are uh, actively engaged with all our counterparts. I've had a recent call um, with the executive vice minister. We see the ambassador regularly. I, I think we are now back to a situation in which the lines of communication are almost fully open. What we're still seeking, Steve, is more engagement on the military and operational side. And I think the Chinese system is ready to take those steps and we're ready to, yeah. to meet them halfway in, in uh, keeping those lines of communications open. Where it's in the afternoon, let's go to the University of Hawaii. Uh, to Brent White to ask his question. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Brent White, Chief Global Officer at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, our question is, is there any possibility that the level three travel advisory to China 
will be lifted or reduced in the near future. It serves as a disincentive to resuming student and scholarly exchanges, which both the United States and China have expressed a desire to increase. Well, look, uh, thank you, Brent, for the question and welcome and aloha to all our friends out in Hawaii. Uh, I, had a, I had a great, good uh, opportunity. I was on the board of the East West Center and I had a chance to work with your institution extensively. Thank you for the work that you are doing. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but I would just simply say that this is certainly an issue under active consideration. And I accept your premise that these travel advisories have served as an inhibition to the kinds of rebuilding the kinds of people to people and other academic exchanges that we've seen in the past. So I, I, I would just simply say under active consideration. The um, a follow up question actually from uh, Pin Ni from Wanxiang American, Dennis Simon from ICAS, both ask, you know, presidency at the, at the dinner you were at talked about 50,000 American students over the next five years going to China. Uh, what's your view of that initiative? And is there a U.S. strategy? I mean, we think, I assume we think this is good to have Americans study in China, speak Chinese and kind of understand their culture better and come back and work in the State Department is a good thing. Well, Steve, I would simply say I first met you when I, well, not my first, but my first really active engagement with you was part of an initiative that I did in the previous Obama administration called 100,000 Strong, right. in which I tried to take active steps, actually work to build a foundation that would actively promote American students studying in China. And we reached that goal of 100,000 over a couple of years, and we were proud of that. Now, a host of things have taken place, COVID, other uh challenges and restrictions, some on our side, some on the Chinese side. Um, I do not believe the environment is as hospitable for educational exchange as it was in the past. And I think both sides are going to need to take steps. It's not just the United States. But we're in a situation now today, Steve, where the number of Chinese students is on the upswing from China to the United States. And the number of American students studying in China has plummeted absolutely. And that's plummeted for a variety of reasons. And it's not only that Americans are looking at other places um, and some choosing to stay home, but I think they do have some concerns about studying in China currently. And there are concerns about academic freedom and the like. Nevertheless, some degree of academic exchange is very much in our interests. And I support that, and I support steps to increase those opportunities and exchanges as we go forward. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's really important. Is the department? I know the department has an initiative to get more Chinese speakers in the lower levels of the. Absolutely, as, as, is it succeeding? And look, we're we're, we're I, I think the truth is, Steve, we're trying to build capacity across the department um, in capacities associated with the Indo-Pacific. At the core of that is an understanding both in language, history, culture of China. And I think those, uh, I think we're coming along, but Steve, these are not initiatives that can bear like, you know, full Quite fruit nice. overnight. It takes a long time. Capacity building is one of the hardest things in the US government. And so ask me in a few years. Yeah. The, uh, I can ask you something today, though, which is, and I'm always amazed, it's like fake news. If you live in China, can you get a security clearance to join the Department of State? If you've lived in China? Yes. A large number of the people that I work I with mean, it, have lived in China and have spent time in China. So, so the person- The answer is yes, of course. Yes, of course. I, people tell me, no, you can't. I go, that's not Every true. single person, Steve, that you talk to in the White House and the State Department has lived in China, not just as diplomats, mm -hmm. but as students and changing or traveling around. So no, uh, that is the, not the case. What are our allies saying about our China policy? Are you getting support, dissent? I, I think we're in a better place now than we were a few months ago. I, I think there were, um, look, the uh, Asia's complicated. They have a little bit of the Goldilocks. You know, they don't like it when it's too hot. 
but they don't like it when U.S. China uh, are building what they view as a G2 over their heads. They want they want um, uh, prudent, careful diplomacy. They want their interests uh, preserved and and their uh, circumstances not dealt with above their heads. I think it would be fair to say that we are in close consultations with allies and partners about um, our relationship with China. I think, I think more than anything else, Steve, they appreciate we're talking to them more about U.S.-China relations. I think in the past, sometimes we did not share as much. We're much more open about what our goals are, what our objectives are. Um, I still think there are some countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, that worry that in a competitive world, they feel like they have to make choices and that they're somehow betwixt and between, and they don't, they don't seek that. They like the attention and the ability to leverage resources, but they don't want to be right. a pawn in a larger global um, competition. And we hear some of that more generally. I think there is general satisfaction about um, about the state of U.S.-China relations. I will say two different things, though. They are worried about the economic trajectory in China. They are not as optimistic about your growth um, uh, numbers as... as That's not my growth yeah, numbers. Or, it's, or, it's, or the it's Chinese China. growth numbers. And, and they worry about the United States as well. And so it's not just that they worry about the state of the relationship, but they worry about the domestic trajectory of both of our countries. Mm -hmm. You've spent a lot of time with the Japanese prime minister this week, yes. who's now in DC. Japan pretty much on the same page as we are? I think that's the case, yes. In fact, we've talked to the uh, our Chinese interlocutors about this relationship. China, uh, I think, has complex views, as you know, uh, Steve, of Japan. But the U.S.-Japan relationship is our most important foundational relationship in Asia. It is grown in importance. It's no longer regional. It's global. They, they're with us in Ukraine, in Haiti, supporting us in Gaza, uh, in the Pacific. I think Prime Minister Kashid is a rare leader. We've been able to um, really um, take the U.S.-Japan relationship to the next level. And it will be on full display over the course of this week. And we will also have a trilateral meeting later this week between the United States, Japan, and the Philippines for the first time. And President Marcos will join us. Let's go to a question from University of California, San Diego. Uh, Gary Zhu. We're not hearing you. You're going to have to try again, Gary. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Gary, a PhD candidate in political science at UC San Diego. It is with great honor to ask uh, Mr. Deputy Secretary Kurt Campbell, who is also a distinguished alumni of UCSD, a question. So my question is, how do you evaluate the possibility of a military conflict between the mainland China and Taiwan over the next decade? And given your evaluation, what do you think the United States will play a role in the future game? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I, I First of all, I want to acknowledge how important the question is, but I do want to just say a word or two. I am not a particularly distinguished graduate of UC San Diego, although I'm very <laughs> fond of my time there. I do want to say that the premier meeting and conference um, every year that is held to basically explore with the best experts in the world where China is going, where the U.S.-China relationship is going, is hosted by UCSD. I think I saw Lei and other friends at UCSD in the audience there, and I want to say hello to them, and we look forward to that meeting in August in La Jolla, following on the meeting that was held this uh, winter here in Washington, D.C., in which uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan gave a key speech about the current trajectory in U.S.-China relations. But what I was going to say is my first introduction to China was a class taught by Susan Shirk. I was a young student. She, she chastised me. I came to a class 
all wet. I had literally gotten off my surfboard. I brought it into class and my wetsuit was dripping wet. And she said, you know, you've got to get yourself in order. You can't, you can't be so disrespectful and you can't track sand and water into my classroom. I think from that point on, I became a little bit more serious of a student. And so grateful to call her a lifelong colleague and friend. Look, the most important thing that we can do uh, is carefully uh, to signal responsibly our determination to maintain peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. And that involves a variety of things, both communications, deployments, clear messaging. I would simply note one of the most important elements of the U.S. strategy in the recent period. In the past, it was often only the United States speaking alone about the absolute need to preserve peace and st stability, to sustain the status quo across the Taiwan Strait, a st status quo that we think has served the interests of the peoples on both sides of the strait. Increasingly, larger numbers of international actors have spoken out as well uh, about uh, their desire to maintain peace and stability, to make sure lines of communication are open. Uh, and uh, to build a degree of trust and confidence. We do see actions on the part of the PRC that are concerning, increasing military activities, deployments that concern us. Um, but at the same time, we uh, uh, persevere in our determination to underscore our critical role uh, as uh, a key guarantor, as outlined in the 1979 a Taiwan Relations Act of that maintenance of peace and stability, which we think has been a tremendous uh, achievement that has propelled the region to greater heights. When we talk about um, uh, the advances in technology, what TSMC has done is remarkable. We're grateful for the partnership that we have, an official partnership with Taiwan on so many different things. Uh, ultimately, it is our um, professed goal to do what's necessary to preserve that peace and stability that has been so critical to the progress we've seen to date. Let's talk a bit about kind of the ancillary effects. I'm a tremendous effect, actually, of our China policy, especially, I would say, the last uh, administration. We've seen a rise in anti-Asian hate crimes. So let, let our next question go to the New England Chinese American Alliance Town Hall, joining us from Newton City Hall in Massachusetts. Hua Wang, over to you. Hello, good evening. So this is Hua Wang, co-chair of New England Chinese American Alliance. So thank you for inviting us to participate in this important conversation. As a community organization, we're concerned about the increasing suspicion of the loyalty and integrity of Chinese Americans, such as the China Initiative. Such suspicions not only hurt the racial minority, we all know about the Japanese American internment, but also tear apart the fabric of American society, such as during the McCarthy era. So how to protect the equal rights of the Chinese Americans and avoid stereotyping Chinese culture and people while managing the complex US-China relations? Thank you. Well, so look, um, I appreciate the question, and I believe that this is a very serious matter. I will simply say that <clears throat> President Biden, Steve, has spoken out on this. He has rejected uh, this kind of stereotyping. He has condemned uh, the attacks on uh, Asian Americans that affect not just Chinese Americans, but across a broad range of groups here in the United States. He's condemned that publicly, repeatedly, um, and in the company of prominent Asian Americans. He's um, appointed for the first time a wonderful person in his administration in the White House, Erica Martsugi, who represents um, uh, Asian and island communities in all things in the White House. She has been tireless in her commitment to ensuring that uh, we are taking every possible step to prevent this kind of blacklisting and, uh, you know, questions about the uh, patriotism of uh, honorable Americans. And so I think those are 
critical efforts underway, and we have to be able to distinguish between perhaps steps or activities, uh, third column things that China has done in the United States, and also the activities of, you know, uh, of Americans. And I, I just think this is a hard issue. And I think over time, um, we are, I think, han handling this issue with greater um, care and understanding than, than perhaps um, it was done four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a large influx of Chinese migrants coming to the United States, kind of leaving China, going sometimes through the Mideast, coming to Mexico and entering it, the it's, United Steve, States. Steve, it, it has not gotten enough attention, but it is a remarkable thing. The number of Chinese economic migrants that have come to the United States uh, over the course of the last, you know, several months, a uh, number in the tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands. It is a remarkable thing. And I would just underscore that these are people, not the many of the people that are coming up the corridor in Latin America are absolutely impoverished with very little to uh, call their own. Many of the Chinese migrants that are coming have had to spend an enormous amount of money to get the airline tickets, to get down to join these groups that come up to the United States. So it is a it is a remarkable thing that we're seeing. It is a subject of some conversation. I think it's fair to say that the Chinese government is aware of it, probably a little concerned by it, um, uh, but I don't think they've taken uh, steps at this juncture to curtail it either. These migrants seem to blend into the Chinese community in the United States rather than being in the you know, taken care of by municipal or state governments. Is that kind of, is my impression correct? Steve, I, th I think that's anecdotal, but I think generally the case, yes. And, um, you know, but the, the truth is the, the numbers that we're seeing are large and, and uh, frankly, of, of, of gathering concern. I think if I don't end this, your staff is probably going to have me, have me lynched but this has been just a tour de force. This is no, a Steve, it's remarkable. Been, no, it it's is a, my pleasure, Steve. You're the you're the host here. It's been my honor and my pleasure. I hope to do this again. Can I just say to the people that have listened, I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate your interest. And Steve, I we don't always agree, but you are my friend, and I appreciate the passion that you bring to this endeavor, this complex endeavor of charting a course. For I, the I value our friendship. And I think you're really one of America's great public service servants. It's really, it's remarkable. But let me just use 30 seconds to thank our speakers and partners across the United States and China for hosting this event. Uh, thanks to the Star Foundation for its continued generosity in funding China Town Hall. And finally, thank you to the National Committee staff for the hard work in coordinating this nationwide, I should say, this worldwide event. Thank you all. Can I also thank my team here at the State Department? We are in the State Department today. They've, they've labored to put this together. I'm very grateful to our technical teams and all the people that have made this possible. Steve, thank you to you and your team. Be well, everyone. Kurt, thank you.